Stefano. Stefano. Okay, so today we have the pleasure to to have uh, Stefano uh, Melacci, professor at University of Siena, as a um, speaker, and, and um, he will um, is a specialist of uh, artificial intelligence and deep learning at this uh, great university in Italy, and we'll have the pleasure to listen to him talking about past and present of deep learning after giving his course at the BR Master here. Um, in uh, Estia and um, important also since uh, we had this problem, technical problem last week with the Marco Gori, um, the, my friend and colleague from uh, University of Siena, he will give his talk next Friday at 3 p.m. So February the 12th at 3 p.m. you will be notified on uh, Estia website and different possibilities. He will give his talk. So now it's your turn uh, Stefano and uh, we'll listen to you with pleasure. Bye bye. Stefano, sorry, please, please unmute. Uh, you unmute it. All right, now you can hear me. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, I was just, let me repeat what I was saying. I was just saying thank you very much for this kind invitation and for this kind introduction. Uh, it's my pleasure to be to be here today and to share with you some, some thoughts and some, you know, uh, some ideas and several considerations about, you know, what happened in the last, I would say, uh, let's say 20 years at most of, you know, uh, machine learning and then uh, deep learning. Um, let me just move ahead. Okay, uh, Professor Miranda already introduced me uh, in a perfect way, so there is not much more, more to say, but uh, uh, in this slide, you know, I don't really want to talk to you about, you know, my face and how it changed in the last 15 years or so. But it's a, it's a way to, to give you a, a nice overview, I think, of, of this seminar and what I'm going to talk about. Uh, because we're really going to go back in time, you know, uh, up to the point in which I was like this. Uh, and then, you know, after a sort of curvy path, I arrived to, to what you see today. And uh, the thing that I just would like, you know, to, to stress a little bit is that even if, you know, now I'm a professor in, uh, in the academy, um, I've not been always in the academy all, all my life. Uh, you know, after my PhD and some, some activities as a postdoc, I left the academy actually and I went to, I moved to the industry, still working on, on machine learning. So I had the pleasure, uh, the honor of, you know, experiencing machine learning both from the academic side of the story and from the, you know, uh, more, you know, industrial side of, of the whole thing. And, uh, you know, it's been a, just a, an experience of some years, mostly in Italy, also sharing some collaborations with a French startup in Nantes. Uh, and then I went back to the academy. I had the opportunity to go back and, you know, I managed to do that. I, I was very happy about it. And, just, you know, so that, that gave me a sort of pretty open view on the, what we are, talk, are going to talk about today. So machine learning and then deep learning. And it allowed me to, you know, to think a lot about, you know, how everything changed in the last year. Just last thing before really uh, starting to, to talk about this, uh, this seminar, uh, that's this picture is about some of the people that, that work with me and in my lab, it's called Scilab. It's a CN Artificial Intelligence Lab. So if, you know, have a look at the website, if you want, you can see demos and software and perhaps you can get more more technical details about what we do, because as I said today, it will be more, you know, uh, a discussion, a pretty open, uh, I'll talk about several topics that, uh, you know, are not uh, going down to, I will not discuss going down to, to the math, but it will be a pretty open uh, and pretty, I would say also long uh, description of what happened as I already anticipated in the last 20 years almost. Um, that's the first part of the seminar. Um, we will go back really to the evolution uh, that we uh, experienced uh, both in the academy, in the research uh, areas, in, gen in the research setting in general, and also in the industry, trying to figure out what was important at different time instants, so that this will sort of uh, draw a path that will reach uh, nowadays. So that's the second part of the seminar. It will be about what do we have now, considering deep learning 
and the you know the the, the great and nice results that we can see uh, everywhere and finally of course the discussion will route to uh, to what's next you know that's also part of the title of, of the seminar uh, of course you know the picture here is telling you much uh, i don't have a crystal ball uh, i don't know what's gonna be but there are some some directions, mostly research direct directions, and some, I would say, uh, some hints uh, from the point of view of how we will be, we will have to behave as researchers and educators in the context of machine learning and to, to let this field progress in uh, with uh, even nicer results than what we already have now. Of course, you know, everything is uh, in light of my experience, so you know, I will not list everything, it's impossible. Uh, I will just emphasize the things that were capturing my attention the most during these years but th there is way more than that i mean so don't take this uh, this presentation as something that tries to, to cover everything just what was really capturing my attention uh, so the first part as i already said is about the past you know uh, of of machine learning uh, i will try to describe it by moving slowly in in different you know uh, uh, time ranges, time intervals, uh, more or less from year 2000, early 2000, and I will, we will see what was going on uh, every five years uh, in the world, in the research, uh, in the industry, and uh, all about machine learning, and then with uh, emphasizing, of course, deep learning. Um, of course, uh, as I said, our story starts from early 2000, so you can see in the bottom of the slide in purple, you see there is this marker, this label, early 2000, that will stay there so that you can easily figure out what uh, precise uh, time interval each slide refers to. Uh, so that's where our story starts. Uh, so it's uh, uh, at that time I was uh, I was a student. Uh, then I was, uh, you know, uh, mostly interested into technology and to video games a lot. Uh, and uh, I started to be uh, attracted by uh, machine learning, uh, more or less you know, early 2000. And, but as I said, mostly as a student. And then this thing really started to, to capture my attention uh, always uh, more and more. Uh, at that time, uh, you know, going along the street and trying to say, uh, to talk with somebody about machine learning or AI, you know, in this seminar, of course, I will not, I will use these two terms sometimes in a, interchangeable manner even you know they are not exactly the same <laughs> i know that but it's, uh, it's just for the purpose of simplifying the description talking about these topics with a random person on the streets it was impossible you know everybody was looking at you with weird eyes with strange eyes if you were trying to talk about you know artificial intelligence and perhaps there were people as i said in the in the context of video games that were understanding the term ai because it was the you know the ai of, of the opponents okay um however this is just to say that it was not a common term talking about machine learning ai is was not common at all it was something really limited to those people that were working in that field and that's it uh, the industry was not ready yet to strongly invest into machine learning based solutions. Of course, I'm not saying there were not important uh, things also in the industry that were happening about machine learning, but if you just try to look in Europe, uh, in the state and during those years, uh, and you try to take an average by covering companies that are in the IT field, well, it was not so, so popular to, to, to talk about in machine learning and to invest into machine learning solutions. Of course, you know, speech recognition was going ahead very well and also applications about document classification. So there was indeed something, uh, something was happening, but it was not nothing compared to what's going on today. So if we try to normalize what's, what happens today and what was so far, I mean, differences are, are huge. Um, in order to, to try to uh, sort of uh, support some of my statements, I will make use of the, the Gartner hype cycle. I think that it's something that many of you already, already know. Uh, and uh, Gartner is, is a leading uh, research company, advisory company. Uh, this is just a, a copy and paste from Wikipedia, what you see in this slide, uh, that provides information, advices, tools for leaders in IT, finance, HR, customer service, marketing, sales. I mean, uh, it's really, uh, it's a company that has, uh, that pays a lot of attention to what are the emerging technologies that every year 
we see uh, you know in around the uh, overall in the world and this curve this this graph that you see on the right is the so-called life cycle because it's it's a curve that it has a bell like shape at the beginning then it goes down and up again uh, basically as long as you move from left to right you measure the maturity of, of some technologies of the listed technologies uh, so technologies that are listed on the left hand side of the picture are, are pretty novel are pretty new uh, and uh, on the on the y axis you have the visibility so you know the uh, let's say how popular are these kind of technologies uh, in the in the current uh, in the considered year of course you know gartner is way more goes beyond this curve and their their activity is very very well more detailed than what you see here but it's a good proxy you know it's a good tool this this picture to motivate what's going on this curve is it's about uh, year 2000 okay and if you just have a look at the names of the technologies that are that are listed you see that uh, you know there is uh, uh, wireless uh, there is uh, something about wireless there is web there are web tops there is bluetooth 3d web uh, you know there are a lot of things that are about technologies connected with uh, with the web of course there is nothing that is really about machine learning here there are some some as i said some some speech recognition keywords here that actually you know uh, perhaps we're not uh, necessarily based on machine learning so this is just to say that early 2000 it was too early to really see concretely see something about machine learning into this this picture why the web was way way more popular web you know uh, xdsl connections and there was java and so on and so forth so you have to imagine that a new technology when it emerges it starts from the left it goes up because it, it becomes very popular then when the curve goes down is because there is a, a sort of uh, you know a reduction of the expectation and that we are perhaps a bit overinflated and then a technology reaches the, the plateau of productivity uh, here uh, in the last the last uh, portion of the picture anyhow uh, at that time looking around in terms of technology the web was really dominating everything uh, oh, everybody's attention was about the web and here you see the picture of what it was the the web page the home page of google at that time in 2001 i think uh, so it was pretty common when talking about information technology to focus on uh, search engines uh, on the web uh, there was also a semantic web that was starting to emerge uh, and you know the, the the rise of google was really something that was was you know considered very important at the time so page rank and all that kind of things were dominating the discussion and there were a lot of business opportunities related to the web that was really the main focus of the attention so that in terms of you know um, data mining uh, and you know all these uh, I would say uh, different applicative fields that were about trying to extract information from data mining from from text data was considered very important because it was way more connected to the web than than uh, you know other kind of of data that you could think of uh, take the case of images they were not uh, so uh, you know efficient at that time so you know strongly considered as as a tool to search the web at that time that was about technology in general then if we try to to put our eyes on what was happening in, in machine learning research so really we are really you know uh, putting our attention in the scientific community of machine learning at that time uh, the attention was really completely focused and most completely focused into kernel methods i mean from the foundational point of views from the point of views of algorithm that was really one of the topics that was mostly driving that was considered mainstream at that time uh, and you know for those that are not aware of how kernel methods work you just have to imagine that once you have your data uh, in a certain uh, input space representation uh, the kernel is a way is a function k that basically models a, a dot product uh, not in the in such input space but in another space uh, in which you know the the data is implicitly mapped by this kernel and at the end of the day the goal is to estimate is that you can you know uh, design a function f that operates in such feature space by mean of the kernel i don't want to be technical into this seminar as i said 
but that's uh, the uh, the kind of intuition that was strongly followed at the time and was strongly and deeply studied. Uh, the popular book on learning with kernels with, from Bernard Sholkoff and Smola and Francis Bucket were books. It was a book that was ex insanely popular in the scientific community. You have to imagine that you know uh, data sets were not big in terms of experiments. Uh, so many people were focusing on uh, on a small number of uh, of, uh, of examples in the data that they used to, to run experiments. Something like you know 1K, uh, 2K. There were a few exceptions of slightly bigger data set that were able to reach 10K or 60K. But I mean most of the experiments were done on a lower scale. In fact. The kernel methods, you know, are not definitely the, the world champions in terms of scalability because you basically the scalability depends on the number of data set of the number of data that you are using to uh, to train the machine. But at that time it was, you know, people were relatively concerned about it because, as I said, uh, experiments in the large scale, very, very large scale settings were, you know, they were, of course, attempted by but not by by the mainstream. So what happened is that uh, the, you know, the mainstream classifier was based on support vector machines that are the most popular instance of kernel methods in the case of classification and, and regression. Um, and uh, there were two keywords associated to, to this topic. One is maximum merging, the other one is uh, support vectors. Uh, about the first keyword, the idea was that a support vector machine was able to, to classify data uh, into, into two classes to handle a binary classification problem by finding a decision boundary that was maximizing the margin with respect to the data. So that this picture you see here was insanely popular at that time. Uh, well, <clears throat> not exactly this one, of course, similar pictures in which you have data belonging to two classes and this data was uh, separated by a hyperplane, the red one, that was estimated by the support vector machine or SVM classifier, and uh, the the distance from this this line and the and the closest data point was maximized. I mean, this line was oriented uh, in a way to maximize this distance. Uh, that's the, the the yellowish area you see here. Uh, the that's that was the first keyword that was very important at that time. It is indeed something important because it. Uh, uh, it maximizes the, uh, it reduces, I mean, the, uh, the, the empirical risk associated to this, uh, uh, to the classification problem. So, you know, it's like, let's try to classify the data doing the best that we can given uh, the, uh, the, the distance between the two classes in a very qualitative way, of course. And uh, uh, the other thing was, uh, the other keyword that was very popular was uh, support vectors. Uh, the reason was that it has to do with also the, the scale of the problem I was talking about. Uh, learning this red function here was something that uh, was only based, well, not learning. Um, after learning, after having trained an SVM, you could identify some important points, support vectors, that were so important that, you know, uh, training the classifier using all your, all your data set or only those points, it was the same. It was leading to the same result. Anyhow, this, these points were only identified at the end of the training stage. So, you know, uh, it was something that was uh, was nice, but uh, it was not so, so immediate as one might think of. Anyhow, the idea of having some special points in your data that were really uh, giving, uh, sort of providing all the information needed to classify your data was a great keyword at that time. And also the idea of maximizing the margin between the two classes uh, in terms of classification boundary was very, very popular. Uh, at that time, if you were going to a conference on machine learning, support vectors and maximum margin, I think they were the more, really the most common uh, keywords. Maximum margin was extremely used also in paper titles to, to just give you the feeling that, uh, you know, a researcher, researcher could, could have when uh, participating to a conference in, in machine learning. It was everything about max, maximum margin. Uh, the other important thing that was strongly emphasized at that time was convexity. Um, the learning problem in SVMs is convex. Uh, so that means that, uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, it, it doesn't, well, in, in principle, it doesn't important from where you start the optimization, you will always reach the same, the same minimum, that's the unique minimum of, of the problem. Uh, 
for this reason, convex problems are usually easier to optimize than non-convex one. And uh, that there is an insane value that was given to convexity. You know, if you were proposing a new algorithm, it was important for that algorithm to, to have, a, you know, a, to be convex so that it was easy to optimize it. Uh, and that's true. I mean, that's, uh, that's, that's still true. Uh, however, uh, at that time, that was enough sometimes to even not consider uh, the, you know, the possibility of putting efforts in trying to do something also with problems that were not convex. Just to give you, uh, you know, a qualitative uh, feeling I had at that time, when, you know, I've been in the States for a while and when talking with other students, uh, every time that there was something that was non-convex, uh, the, the, the PhD students that I was meeting there, they were reacting like, oh, it's not convex, uh, it's hard to optimize, mm, let's find a different way to do that. So it was very extreme, this emphasis on convexity that was indeed motivated, but perhaps it was a bit too extreme because people were not really explore, uh, exploring uh, another, another face of, uh, you know, another side of the coin. At that time, um, if you were selecting a random paper on machine learning, uh, yeah, it was very likely that it was talking about the maximum margin, as I said, but it was also very likely that that paper included a precise theoretical study on the proposed idea. Not always, of course, but there was a very, very important attention in providing, you know, bounds and limits or uh, conditions of, optim of optimality uh, of the proposed algorithm. It was considered very important. It is very important. So what I'm saying in this seminar, I'm just trying to, to point to, to try to shape uh, a saliency map over the things that were considered more important than others. This one was considered very, very important. The, the fact that people were working on, um, uh, on support vector machines, on kernel methods, what was also creating the right conditions for uh, studying, uh, you know, learning uh, from the mathematical point of view. Uh, and uh, that you at any hour, I mean, it was really uh, an important feature to, to stress the theoretical properties of, of the, uh, the, the algorithm. The reason why I'm saying this is also because in the rest of the seminar, we will see how the importance of these different topics will evolve over time. So what you see on the left is just a random screenshot taken from, you know, just a random picture taken from, from a paper of, of that time. So what about neural networks? You know, were there any neural networks at that time? Of course, neural networks were already there and uh, since, uh, you know, way longer than that, but it's, uh, uh, they were indeed studied, but they were not the mainstream. They were inspiring, fascinating, the idea of having a model with units interconnected that somehow loosely resembled, resembled the, the human brain, of course, it's just, you know, a very loose uh, uh, similarity. Uh, it was very, a very, you know, interesting topic at that time as well. However, the optimization problem was not convex. And as I said, if it's not convex, then it's not interesting. That was the kind of, uh, you know, uh, logic statement that people were, were evaluating in their mind at that time. Uh, there were some contexts in which neural networks were indeed more important than others especially in the case of online learning, also in speech recognition, also handwritten, uh, handwritten text uh, recognition. So there were some contexts in which neural networks were strongly uh, studied, but anyhow, they were not the mainstream. Um, let's try to have a look at applications. What, what was happening there? Uh, well, not application. Let's have a look to, to fields that are focusing on something that goes in a precise direction in terms of application, like natural language. Uh, machine learning started to replace uh, knowledge engineering approaches. So approaches in which, you know, you are just basically writing down if then rules. Uh, and uh, however, uh, the, if you were trying to look at applications in natural language, using simple classifiers like Nightbase was still very popular. Uh, you don't have to think that there was necessarily a neural network somewhere. And there were also a lot of studies about unsupervised discovering of latent semantics. So, you know, taking a batch of documents and trying to extract information out of, out of, of such collection automatically, uh, main topics, important words, and so on and so forth. That was the kind of level of maturity of this, uh, of machine learning related technology in, in this context. 
In the case of vision, um, the, the feature engineering approach was still strongly dominating the scene. Um, what was happening is that people were strongly studying ways to um, extract features out of the images in a hard-coded way. I mean, providing algorithms to extract features and uh, pixel descriptors, nothing that was learned from data. It was all, you know, uh, uh, it was all uh, hard-coded given uh, uh, without any kind of uh, uh, learning behind that. And SIFT, if you ever heard about SIFT, S-I-F-T, the scripter, uh, it was very popular at that time and it was really, really interesting. Uh, that was really one of the most outstand outstanding results in computer vision of, of that time. But of course, there was also something that was going down uh, into a more straightforward, I would say, um, applicative context. And that, uh, for example, consider the, the face recognition problem. Uh, there was the popular approach from Paul Viola and Michael Jones that that's still one of a very popular face uh, recognizer. At that time, you know, it started to, uh, to, to become popular. Speed was an issue. Uh, there was a lot of emphasis in trying to find solutions that could run real time. So feature engineering, trying to go real time and so on and so forth. Then, you know, machine learning was not really, was, was still used as a tool, but not to extract low level features. In terms of software libraries, what was happening was that um, you know, uh, some ad hoc implementations of algorithms were strongly used. Uh, MATLAB started to become popular. However, many people were still doing everything in, you know, in their own language, uh, with their own uh, approach. Uh, C, C++ were still very common. But MATLAB started to, to create the first conditions in which, uh, you know, people were using a single environment to you know, to work with data, to plot data, to design machine learning algorithm. But it was just, you know, just the beginning uh, in the context of machine learning. And the hardware was, of course, extremely limited. Uh, single core processor, the RAM sizes were pretty relatively small, considered nowadays standards. And uh, graphics card were doing graphics. So there were no special graphics hardware used for, for machine learning. Uh, as you know, as it happens uh, today. Uh, let's move to the second uh, time slot, time interval from 2006 and 2010. That's where something started to change, because during these years there was a transition into the research community. At least that's that's my personal feeling. Uh, the scientific results of the previous year started to open uh, their application to uh, you know to. Uh, computer vision and natural language related uh, tasks. Uh, and some new ideas started to circulate, creating you know, the, the groundings of deep learning. I mean, people started to talk about deep learnings around uh, those years, but you know, it really exploded a bit later than that, but it was already there. The industry was still not really pushing a strong investment into machine learning. It was better than five years before, but there was not a revolution yet. Uh, and uh, um, machine learning was still in, in research mostly. Uh, what about the Gartner curves? The one on the left is about 2006. The one on the right is about August uh, 2010. So you see, I tried to highlight some, some keywords that are still about speech recognition. There is something about video search, some, you know, some applications then were using some machine learning, of course. Uh, but, you know, you don't really see something that really the string machine learning in this uh, in these curves. What about the research in machine learning? Um, there was a lot of emphasis, emphasis into two main directions. Uh, the first one was statistical relational learning uh, or one of the other ways to, to talk about it. Uh, so trying to work with data that was not only about single examples but data with some, uh, you know, uh, relations in between uh, and trying to, you know, to uh, interleave learning with this kind of uh, more structured representations. While in the context of kernel methods, uh, kernel machines in general, uh, the topic, the field of semi-supervised learning, the framework of semi-supervised learning was, was strongly, uh, was really getting, a, a, you know, a, a lot of attention. And you know, in semi-supervised learning, what happens is that you do not only learn from data for which you have a supervision attached to them. 
you learn also from data that is, you know, it's it's raw, it's given as it is. Nobody tries to to attach a label to that data, but that data still still have a lot of information. So you know, that's uh, many people were of course focusing on this kind of uh, framework of semi-supervised learning because it was considered, and you know, it, it does make sense. It's the the most natural learning setting. I mean, we as human, we get supervision, we get some interactions from, we, we get some support from other people, but most of the time, you know, we go around by ourselves, we look, uh, we experience the world without having a supervision. So it was strongly inspiring the research community, the idea of working in a semi-supervised setting. Where, where is, well, where, where uh, deep learning uh, was at that time? Uh, well, as I said, it was exploding. It was it was beginning, I would say, uh, not really exploding yet, but uh, there were some results in terms of deep belief networks, deep Boltzmann machines uh, that were, you know, pushed. You see some reference here. The works from from Benjo and from Jeffrey Hinton was were started to um, diffuse the idea that having several layers, several representations of the data. Uh, could be a good idea uh, to capture, you know, more complex dependencies and to exploit compositionality into the process. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was not, uh, it was something that was already known from, from earlier than that. But people were mostly working with architectures that nowadays are called shallow, because there were also some important theoretical results suggesting that it was enough to use shallow architecture to model any kind of functions. However, these works started to, on deep belief network, on deep Boltzmann machines, started to make the idea of having multiple representations of the data, deeper representations of the data, uh, more popular. What's important for, the, that's an important thing I want to, to remark is that when these approaches became popular, the idea was to use unsupervised learning to pre-train the network, to pre-train the, the architecture. And then there was just a final fine tuning based on supervision. So, as I said, unsupervised data was playing an important role at that time. And it was, you know, something that, as I already told you, in the case of semi supervised learning, was also inspired by the way human uh, work. What about another class of very popular neural networks nowadays, convolutional neural networks? They were already known in the in the 90s, but they, they started to reattract the attention of research during these years, uh, 2006, 2010, roughly. Uh, mostly because there were some very, very interesting applications using deep, sorry, using convolutional neural networks, uh, stacked convolutional layers, uh, and there were, you know, with, with good results. Uh, and several studies that were trying to find good ways of combining convolutional layers together in order to get, uh, you know, something that was working in, in concrete application. Um, so the, this strong experimental activity was also supported by the, the growing ubiquity of uh, big data sets, big uh, yeah, uh, supervised data set mostly, to help people to make experiments on a larger scale and to really experience what was going on into these deep architectures. Uh, as in the case of the previous time interval, what was going on in computer vision? Computer vision was uh, strongly attracted by a competition that started in 2005. It was called the Pascal VOC, Pascal Visual Object uh, uh, Challenge, it's VOC. Uh, this competition went on for several years and it was about, you know, having several images and try to find objects inside the images and, and some variants of this. Uh, and uh, all the approaches that were dominating the scene were still based on uh, features that were engineered, that were, you know, uh, designed uh, from scratch without real learning. Uh, and of course, afterwards, these features were somehow aggregated and there was a, a machine learning model on top of them. But however, there was a lot of low level feature engineering, manual definition of these features, and those models that were dominating the scenes were also based on, on uh, you know, it, uh, on uh, the identification of parts of objects that were, you know, somewhat connected together to decide whether an object was there or not. So there was a lot of uh, attention to this, you know, uh, low level understanding of the scene, part based understanding of the scene and so on and so forth. What about software? 
you know the picture of MATLAB is still there and it is bigger than what I was showing in the previous slide. And the reason is that now MATLAB was way, way more popular. If, if I'm not wrong, uh, also the, you know, the code that was used to, to measure the performances in the Pascal VOC uh, competition was provided in MATLAB. MATLAB became de facto one of the most used solution to develop machine learning algorithm. If you were a researcher at that time, I was a researcher at that time, uh, you know, I was, you know, uh, releasing some code from time to time and it was a MATLAB implementation and all other people, most of other people were doing the same. So MATLAB became the platform and uh, this actually helped in improving the, the, the growth of research into the context of machine learning. What about hardware? CPUs were faster than five years uh, before, of course. Uh, multiple core CPUs started to be there and to be exploited by, by software, not so easily at the beginning. Uh, the amount of available memory was bigger, so people could, could start to do something at a larger scale in terms also of the, the data set size. We are not really in the GPU era yet, uh, and CPUs were still the most common you know, uh, uh, computational units for machine learning. And as you see from the picture, some new players, well, a new player emerged. It's, it's the iPhone here, but you know, the, in general, the, all the uh, trend that, that went over smartphones started to, to dominate the scene. And in terms of technology, that really you know, uh, was something that started to be uh, actively considered uh, by uh, everybody. So let's switch to the other time slot, the one from 2010 and 2015. So we're getting closer to, to nowadays. These are the years in which deep learning really became reality. As I said, it was already there before, but in those years, it really exploded everywhere. Um, the keyword deep learning started to, to, you know, to navigate, to spread over the machine learning research community with uh, big, uh, very high speed. Uh, there were some papers from Joshua Benjo and, you know, the, the, the most important one, I would say, is the, uh, the, the Nature paper from Likan, Benjo and Hinton that afterwards, some years afterwards, they won the ACM uh, Turing Award about, you know, these uh, this results in deep learning. And the industry started to react, concretely react to this popularity. These are the years in which we can really observe a reaction. If we just take Google as example, Google, Google opened the, the Google Brain uh, section, the Google Brain project in 2010, and then they, they bought DeepMind, that's a company that was precisely uh, created to deal with machine learning problem and deep learning solutions. Uh, Google decided to, to, to buy it uh, in 2014. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I took this screenshot from an article in which that was stressing the fact that Google started to remark itself as a machine learning first company. That's because machine learning started to touch different projects, started to touch different applications that in the previous years were not even, you know, linked to, to machine learning based solutions. So these are the years in which we really observe uh, a growing popularity of deep learning. What about uh, Gartner? What about this, this curves? The one on the left is, is from uh, 2011, and uh, you start seeing some popular tasks that are uh, commonly faced with machine learning, you know, natural language Q&A, translation, uh, and so on and so forth. But if you check the curve on the right, you see that highlighted an important keyword over there. That's machine learning. So machine learning was there. It was almost at the top of the hype, with you know inflated expectations. This is just to tell you that uh, also the industry was reacting to this uh, growing popularity of machine learning, and this was very good. But it was also something that was uh, that increased the hype behind this technology in a too strong manner, I would say. Have a look at the you know the virtual assistants here. I highlighted it with a different uh, color. Uh, just because it's it's a technology that was already there in the in the previous uh, Gartner curves, uh, but that uh, that you know um, behave in a sort of weird way because during the years it went back on the top of the hype, because virtual assistants at a certain point uh, in early 2000 they started to to get to, to be uh, popular. They were not so good. In 2010, 2015, in these years, they were completely reevaluated and their, their, 
you know, their quality started to be improved. They became a technology on which uh, it was really uh, interesting to invest for the future. But what's important is that machine learning is there. The keyword machine learning is there. Um, neural networks are back. Uh, these are the years in which we see kernel methods. If you remember, I started the discussion talking about kernel methods. We see kernel methods uh, going down, going to the corner, and neural networks, they went back because of their incredible results in, in, in benchmarks and in several um, applicative fields. So the fact that their optimization problem was not convex was not an issue anymore for people. Uh, and for example, in speech recognition, there was a, an incredible breakthrough that really improved the accuracy of speech recognizer strongly. And as I said, the fact that smartphones were uh, techno were you know uh, elements that were considered strongly by the industry during these years and in the following ones also pushed the emphasis over, for example, speech recognition technologies. So this is one of the applicative fields in which we saw a breakthrough. But the other one is computer vision. There was this deep neural network, deep convolutional network called AlexNet. In 2012 at NIPS, the most important conference in machine learning, it was presented and uh, it uh, allowed uh, the, the system to achieve impressive performances. And it's the first deep learning model that really beated the previous uh, computer vision, uh, the, the algorithms of the previous years, the one based on parts, the one based on uh, engineered features. Because now we are not uh, designing feature uh, from scratch anymore. It's the neural network that it is learning what is important, what is not, what are the features to extract at different levels from, from the image. So it's a big revolution. These results really completely uh, changed uh, people's mind in terms of, in the case of computer vision. Also because of the availability of very large scale data set like ImageNet, I, I'm sure you already heard about it and the important challenge associated to it. So we went from Pascal Voc challenge to ImageNet large scale visual recognition challenge with 1000 categories. Uh, and uh, WordNet is composed by way more, more than that. There, there are millions of annotated examples of images. Uh, and that's very important that you remember this because we're really talking about completely supervised data. There is no unsupervised learning anymore almost. In the case of language, sequence to sequence model became important. So models in which you just take your data, you provide it to the network. The network virtually reads the sentence. So you see the quotes. Uh, and then it tries, for example, to, to produce the same sentence in another language. Going straight, you know, from input to output by putting uh, recurrent neural networks in the middle. And that was another outstanding result. And everybody started to talk about end-to-end -end learning. So instead of taking the input data, uh, carefully pre-processing, carefully designing the features to extract, and only afterwards ask a neural architecture to do something, uh, in end-to-end -end systems, we directly go from the input to the predictions and the ground truth that are compared with this prediction by means of a neural architecture. Uh, and this, you know, it's, it sounds way simpler than start trying to design features uh, by hand. Uh, and uh, it's also something that was strongly popularized in the context of, of uh, deep learning, leading very nice improvements in uh, natural language processing and not only that. But as I said, everything was completely supervised. The data was supervised. So even if facing the learning problem started to become simpler, uh, the, uh, the difficulty was shifted into collecting big data sets. And in most real world cases, that was not something that could be done. Uh, small companies couldn't afford the, the, you know, the, the burden of uh, the economical and the, you know, the, the burden in terms of human resources to uh, set up uh, big supervised data because attaching supervisions to example is costly. It requires experts, it requires a lot of work. So that even if there were these outstanding results in a big, big, big data set and in benchmarks, the reality of several small and medium sized company was not something that was really uh, coherent with that, with that setting. And moreover, where is the, uh, the unsupervised data, you know, started to be not so considered as they were in the past. Even if, as I said, it was in the past, it was considered semi-supervised learning something very natural. 
uh, but these groundbreaking results really dominated the scene and they were all about supervised data. Something more happened in terms of software. You see there is no MATLAB anymore. Uh, well, MATLAB was still there actually, but there were new players in the, uh, in the scene. TensorFlow, I think you know, everybody knows it, Torch and afterwards, uh, later than that, PyTorch, Theano, Keras, Cafe. Uh, they were software solutions that made very easy uh, to implement neural models, deep neural models, because the key features they had is that they were commonly interfaced to scripting languages such as Python or other languages. Uh, so it was pretty simple and immediate to use them and they were able to compute gradients automatically and gradients are what is used to uh, as a key element to, to adjust the parameters of deep neural models. With these softwares you didn't have to write down the code by yourself to compute the gradients of your deep model and you could start to compose different architectures. That was a big revolution in terms of accessibility of machine learning tools to a very, very wide audience. And the hardware was definitely way better than before because we are in the GPU era, the one in which mostly NVIDIA, uh, you know, made uh, GPUs more accessible because of the uh, uh, toolkit they wrote, the software toolkit they wrote, CUDA, and also because the prices went down. In some uh, deep learning applications, GPUs were returning a uh, speed up in terms of training time and inference time that was huge. Here I wrote like, you know, 10 per or something else. I mean, there is not a magic number here, but it, the, the, the improvement was significant. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, so that's another important factor that made deep learning way, way more popular. So we are getting very close to, to today and uh, to nowadays. Uh, in, we're in 2015 up to 2019, roughly, uh, these are the years of the settlement of deep learning. Uh, VCs were, you know, started to be, to be ready to invest an insane amount of money in machine learning startups all over the world. Uh, the industry that was already considering machine learning now is seriously considering it way more also out of the context of information technology. Other companies that are not about IT, they started to understand that there were situations in which they could benefit from the use of machine learning in some of the internal, you know, uh, uh, pipelines of the company. Uh, and the keywords machine learning AI, they started to, to become something popular also for people that are not in the field. You remember I started this discussion by saying that um, it was not so popular in 2000, early 2000, to talk about machine learning to somebody that you were finding, you were meeting on the streets. During these years, uh, things were different because, for example, cell phone commercials started to use the keyword artificial intelligence. Uh, several apps were based on AI technologies, okay? So this keyword started to circulate in the mind of people that were not in the field. So it's, it's really a commercial thing, but it's interesting to see uh, the, the importance that also, as I said, the industry was giving to this kind of keywords and topics. What about the Gardner curve? Well, in this case, you see I highlighted it on top of this uh, peak. In the peak of inflated expectations, we have machine learning that is way higher than before, and also deep learning. Deep learning, it is explicitly mentioned. You see there is deep learning and machine learning, two keywords. Uh, that's a clear message of the importance that uh, people that were in the technology field were giving to this kind of technologies. But as you all can also guess, uh, the, this, we are in the peak of inflated expectations. So uh, perhaps this also distorted a bit the understanding on what this technology could or could not do. Because in these years, it was looking like, at least getting closer to 2015, uh, it was looking like, you know, these technologies could do everything and solve any problem. Uh, of course, it was not like that, but they were uh, providing uh, outstanding results. What about the research in machine learning? Many, many papers on deep learning and a huge number of technical reports. If you know what Archive is, it's a public repository for technical reports. Uh, well, people started to use it massively by publishing tons of technical reports on different tasks, on different settings, on whatever. During those years, it was insanely common to search 
a keyword into uh, the web just to look for some scientific results in a certain precise uh, experimental setting or with some precise problems. And it was very easy to find something because you see this, this cloud that I sketched here. I mean, the, the, the size, the volume of this uh, scientific production exploded. Uh, and uh, these also, again, pushed up the, uh, the, the expectations on what these technologies could do. Uh, and they, you know, the they situation helped to maturate the misconception uh, also that in order to publish something, uh, not all, only as a technical report, but at competing uh, at very high level conferences, you needed to beat a benchmark. And that was really, really bad because everybody was just trying to get, you know, an accuracy that was just a little bit higher than somebody else, just a little bit. And that was a strong requirement. If you were trying to propose new ideas that were not so good in terms of results, but they were new. If you were trying to study some theoretical properties of some new directions, that was somewhat, you know, uh, several times, you, you, you know, reviewers were not reacting positively to this because the overall mainstream trend was to beat benchmarks and to do something better and better and better. And theory was replaced, not completely, but the importance of theory, if you remember, I said in the case of kernel methods, theory was way important. Now theory went down and uh, there were this uh, invasion of papers in which there are just some neural architectures with blocks connected somehow. You try to do something, you get some nice results and that's it. That is not bad, but you know, it's in terms of understanding, it's a bit, a bit limited. In computer vision, you know, there is there are some great improvements in terms of object uh, detection and also on uh, semantic labeling, segmentation, uh, and the you know the the visual quality of the results that people could more easily produce started to be impressive. Uh, these are the years in which you could find great YouTube videos or uh, insane results that were really something that many people that uh, uh, perhaps, uh, you know, uh, were not, you know, at, uh, working in uh, the most important lab of the world, they started to be able to do uh, very, very concrete and important things thanks to the availability also of uh, software tools that sped up the development a lot. And also in natural language, something similar happened. Okay, so people started to talk about attention. Uh, so, you know, again, it's not important to be technical, but the old sequence to sequence model I presented was mostly, most of the time, replaced by a model in which there was this idea of the machine that learns which are the words that are important to make a certain prediction. That's basically the concept of attention that was made extreme. Uh, after the paper of uh, a new paper of 2017 on uh, transformers that are just neural architecture that are pushing attention models to the extreme. Uh, and this idea of uh, uh, letting the machine learn on what to focus uh, about your, your input data every time, uh, it's what something still today is really uh, considered pretty, pretty hot. Um, you remember I was highlighting the keyword virtual assistance at a certain point in the Gartner uh, curves, uh, because during those years, virtual assistance became something, you know, commercially speaking, very popular and their quality improved. There were better results in speech recognition, better technology, better language representation uh, methods. Uh, you know, so here you see a picture of Amazon Alexa, but you know, there could be also Cortana, Google Now, or, you know, uh, every kind of other popular uh, virtual assistant. So it became reality to have something that to which you could talk to uh, to ask for uh, for a command. That's the point. You could ask a question and get an answer or, you know, ask the system to do something. It's all, all about sending commands. There was no real dialogue, no real conversation. But anyhow, that was impressive and it is still impressive. People also started to, to mix vision and language together uh, so that to, cal to have a look at this picture on the right, some technologies were developed to generate captions. So you provide an image to the machine, the machine generates the text that is the caption. This means that the machine has to, you know, to implicitly recognize what's going on in the image uh, in a way or another. 
and there were some outstanding applications were, were, were proposed. It was really, really, really impressive. Uh, another thing that exploded during those years was the idea of using generative adversarial networks. Uh, that's are basically uh, models uh, based on neural networks in which uh, the, the network learns to generate new data that looks very coherent with the real world data that is provided to the machine. Um, and it's all based by, you know, two convolution, sorry, two networks that are basically fighting each other. You know, one tries to generate good data, the other ones try to, to spot the fake data from the real one, and from this fight, something good uh, emerges. Uh, the issue here is that, well, not the issue, uh, the, um, using these generative models at the beginning was not so, was not immediately captured as something that was important, uh, you know, in application just at the at the beginning. Then, you know, they started to dominate, I would say, the uh, applicative uh, scenario. Uh, you know, there were several approaches, for example, for image to image translation. So you provide an image to the to the system and you get a sort of transformed instance of that image, you know, male to female. Uh, a picture of you, uh, the original picture of you and you when you are older or younger, uh, generation of sketches. This is all about uh, image to image translation and generative models are uh, hidden inside these technologies, mostly uh, generative adversarial networks. So these results were started to become very, very, very attractive and way, way more popular during uh, moving from 2015 to 2019. Something important that happened in, this, in those years was not only about, uh, you would say, uh, beating benchmarks. Uh, it was also about winning competitions or, you know, uh, the, the results of Google's AlphaGo really was really outstanding. In 2016, they were able to uh, diffuse to, to, you know, this, uh, to show the results of this machine that was trained with reinforcement learning that for those that doesn't know, it's just a, a learning framework in which the machine tries to do something and it gets a penalty or a reward if it did something wrong or something good, uh, respectively. And from this, you know, uh, procedure of making different attempts and getting back a feedback, the machine can learn to, to behave in a way or another. The machine was able to learn to play this game called Go, the one you see on, on the right, that's not so, you know, I'm not an expert, but uh, I know that it's pretty complicated to model uh, the behavior on a, of a machine that plays Go, for example, by, by rules. Uh, and uh, this result was way, way impressive. And uh, when I was a student, you know, uh, the example of Go was shown to me as the example of a game that was very, very hard to think that uh, an artificial intelligence based solution could beat it. In 2016, that became reality because the uh, the world champion, the human world champion on this on this game was was beaten by uh, by a machine, by, by a neural network, basically trained with reinforcement learning. So it was really really impressive. Um, uh, people also started to focus more on on graphs, on data represented as graphs, uh, and another class of neural networks became popular graph neural networks. They were actually proposed by you know, uh, some of my colleagues here in Siena. Uh, the paper from Franco Scarcelli, Professor Gori and other authors. Uh, it was published in 2008, but it was you know, circulating here in our lab earlier than that uh, as a technical report. So at that time, it was really a very nice idea with a strong theoretical study with some, some results, the best you could get at that time. Uh, in the last five years, this model became important again because people needed networks to process data that is represented as a graph. Think about, you know, social networks, we are in front of a big graph uh, or, you know, every kind of linked data you can think of. So there was the need of neural networks for that task and graph neural networks are a model that certainly uh, do, does something in that direction. However, it became reality also something new that neural networks can be easily fooled. Um, and uh, I don't know if you ever saw those, some of those pictures, but it's, uh, it was shown that if you provide the picture of a school bus, for example, to the machine, 
uh, and it, you know, the, the network correctly predicts it, uh, the deep network correctly predicts it as a school bus. If you just slightly change it, so, so you get the picture here on the right that it looks the same to a human, the machine, instead of predicting school bus, it predicts, I don't know, cat or some animals or something that has nothing to do with school buses. So there is huge sensitivity to perturbation in the input, to certain perturbation of the input data that basically can fool the neural network. And that's a big issue. Uh, think about a camera that is uh, mounted in an airport and it is, you know, uh, uh, for security reason uh, and that detects a weapon. OK, you want, you know, the, the camera, the system to detect the weapon and to raise a major alarm. But if the weapon is changed in a way that in a very you know, simple way, but the texture of the weapon is changing just a little bit, perhaps the machine, with respect to what, what commonly looks like, perhaps the machine will end up in predicting a different class and to recognize a gun as a bottle, and that's a big, big problem. It's an intrinsic property of neural networks and you know, other classifiers. You know, it's not a, like uh, something that is only about neural networks. And uh, there are a lot of studies into this field. It's called adversarial machine learning. Uh, and you know, in these years, those studies became uh, more and more important. That's all for, for the past, okay? So we can now talk about the present. So I think you understood that a lot of things happened. And a lot of things that were important at a certain point, they were considered less important five years afterwards. There were several changes in the attention of people and groundbreaking uh, and great results in the, in the last five years using deep learning technologies. Today, uh, you know, uh, today, when I say today, I, I mostly refer to, to last year, let's say 2020, uh, just to give you a number in your mind. Uh, it's been a bad year for everybody. It is still not great even now, uh, but how for other reasons. Uh, but anyhow, uh, in these years, uh, the, as I said, the industry started to, to I would say that uh, I observed at least uh, still some, you know, increases in the sense in terms of numbers of industries that are not in the IT field, but they see uh, an opportunity in using machine learning based solutions to improve the supply chain. That's great, but uh, you know, uh, that's not always, these companies are not always ready to perceive the limits of machine learning. Uh, sometimes the keyword deep learning resonates in their minds and they, that's, uh, it still sounds that uh, this keyword can solve everything. Uh, you know, while talking about today and the future, you know, I will start to be more I would say more critic, I will, I will raise more concerns because what I described so far in the past, it's, it sounds like everything is great. Now I want also to stress what's not great because that's what we have to consider when deciding how to react. Machine learning, indeed, it is extremely popular. Uh, the stupid example you see in this slide is about an Italian TV show that's very popular to the average audience in Italy. Uh, and uh, it's uh, some days ago, some weeks ago, uh, they were talking about machine learning. You know, I was like, what? Uh, this is just to tell you how uh, popular this, this keyword is nowadays. And uh, the Gartner curve includes the keywords machine learning and AI in different positions of the, this uh, bell-like shape at the beginning. Moreover, there is also an hype cycle that is specifically about artificial intelligence. It's there. So this is just to tell you that uh, the, uh, the emerging technologies uh, are strongly looking at AI uh, also uh, today. Uh, the research in machine learning is still bigger than what it was already in the last five, in the previous five years. Uh, take a look at these graphs. This is the picture of the number of papers submitted at NeurIPS, that's the most important company, um, conference sorry, of the field. And you can see that's, that's insane. I mean, uh, if you look at 2017, there were uh, 3,000 submissions. Now there, are nine, there has been 9,000 submissions in the last edition. So it's, it's huge. I mean, it's three times in just, in just three years, four years at most. Uh, and the number of accepted paper, yeah, it, it increased in a, in a similar way. But, uh, of course, it's complicated to enter this conference. But the reason why I'm telling you this is that there are a lot of people trying to, that are working on machine learning. 
a lot of people are trying to make the research uh, the research visible to a wide audience using social networks in a massive way you are publishing technical reports that that you know that are not subject uh, to uh, to any review uh, they publish these technical reports very very quickly uh, and the, the clouds that you see here, they just tell you that everything really exploded. There is a lot of stuff. If I open up my Facebook account of, or Twitter, I see many announcements of people. Everybody is realize, uh, 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 releasing its own library. Everybody is releasing its own great results. Uh, it's, it's, uh, in my opinion, it's, it's, too, it's way too much than uh, what it should be. Uh, but, you know, it's good to see that there's fears this field is so popular, but the situation is really getting out of control. Um, machine learning, as I already said, widely touches the industry, uh, and uh, we have the opportunity as Scilab, as Lab, to collaborate with companies that are not, that are in the, with a company that is in the field of oil and gas, you know, so definitely not a field that is focusing on machine learning. And actually, we are doing a lot of machine learning based activities with great results. Uh, something that I can tell you in one of the applications that we published this in a workshop of, at NeoRips uh, some months ago, uh, and uh, we got results that perhaps 10 years ago for me, uh, they were not even something that could be achieved with uh, the technologies of 10 years ago. Today, we really did something impressive by recognizing small defects into X-ray scans that, you know, defects that are pretty hard to recognize for a human, very contextual. So, impressive results everywhere. Let's have a look at the major companies. I'm just listing NVIDIA, DeepMind, and OpenAI, but there is more than that. NVIDIA re released StyleGAN 2, generating images. What you see here are fake images generated by the machine with high resolution, high quality. That's extremely impressive. So, it's a GAN, it's a generative adversarial network. Um, uh, DeepMind is, has just beaten, just a few weeks ago, uh, a 50-year-old uh, challenge uh, that's about, well, a 50-year-old problem that was studied in the last years in a challenge uh, that's about protein folding. Uh, so also in this kind of topics, machine learning is really doing something impressive. And uh, in the case of uh, OpenAI, I think uh, most of you already heard about GPT-3 that generated uh, this, this article that was published in the, in the, in the Guardian. Uh, it was the editorial, perhaps I don't remember. Uh, so it's text generated automatically by a machine. It looks like written by a human. It is syntactically perfect. I mean, that's extremely impressive. And that's about neural networks, deep models, with uh, 175 billion of parameters, a huge model. Another recent result from a few weeks ago is the so-called DAL-E. So you write some text like an armchair in the shape of an avocado, and that's what the system, the pictures you see here, are generated by the machine automatically, starting from that text. That's again impressive. 12 billion of parameters here, huge numbers. Uh, now, let's think about this for a moment, uh, because now we we'll start to, to raise concerns. Are these technologies energy efficient? Well, uh, in order to run this training algorithms, in order to exploit, also to make predictions with architectures with billions of parameters, you need a lot of hardware uh, that uh, will uh, use a lot of power. So we have to ask ourselves something also about, you know, power, money, and what about the environment? These networks are basically black boxes. They get an input, they make a prediction. But if you provide the prediction to a human, if there is a wrong prediction, the human will ask you, okay, why the machine said that? Tell me why. And that's not an easy answer if you just take a deep architecture. Yes, there are some numbers that are combined in a way that, you know, an expert knows how, how they work but it's not something from which you immediately get a human interpretable explanation easy. The other thing I want to remark is, do this technology understand? The notion of understanding must be very well contextualized. These machines, these architectures, the neural architectures, they do not understand as we human do, okay? They are very, very good manipulators and indexers of data. They learn to behave in a certain way given the data that you provide to the machine. But the way they take decision 
has no guarantees to be even, you know, to be related to what we do as humans. Okay, uh, they are good at solving the task that you, you know, that you ask the machine to solve, but that's it. They they are not able to, uh, you know, to develop a notion of understanding that has even that has anything to do with with human. So you see the big no here. Um, now, many people uh, will say that, uh, you know, if you ask some people, OK, but what do we do to make these technologies better? They will say, oh, we need bigger data sets. We need bigger hardware. We need more power. We need, you know, um, can we really think that in order to push this machine to a level in which they understand in a similar way that what we do as human, that's only a matter of data size. Uh, it sounds really a bit too extreme. And uh, here you have a picture, a funny picture that I took. You, you have all the reference here that was done by uh, 11 years old uh, uh, little girl. Uh, and uh, it's about a story. I don't remember the origin of the story. I'm sorry about that. But the point goes like this. There are some monkeys that want to, to reach the moon. And the first monkeys, they just look at the moon reflected uh, in a lake and they say, oh, come on, look, the moon is there. But then they realize that they cannot touch it. So they immediately realize that there's a failure. Other monkeys are jumping into a tree and they say, look, I'm getting closer to the moon. Then other monkeys might, might get higher on that tree or they might, might look for other trees, other taller trees, and they can say, hey, we are even closer to the moon. So it sounds like reaching the moon, it's only a matter of finding taller trees. Well, you immediately understand that that's not the case. At a certain point, this will not work. But there is a monkey down here on the top, uh, the bottom left corner of the picture that is building a spaceship. And, but you know, she is on the ground. So the other monkeys that are climbing on trees and getting closer and closer to the moon, they are making jokes out of the monkey that is on the on the on the earth uh, on the earth right, and trying to build a spaceship because that monkey is not going any higher than that, but she is actually uh, getting the right direction. The reason why I'm saying this is because it sounds like with now modern deep learning technologies, we are really trying to reach the moon by looking for taller trees, more data, bigger models, and so on and so forth. That's the situation that I perceive uh, today. Uh, most of the modern uh, results into in this in this topic are about uh, you know interconnected blocks neural blocks layers uh, whatever you want to call them that are pre-designed into popular software tools on one hand you get nice results in several tasks however most of the time it's all about trial and error uh, there are there is not enough effort in studying problems from the point of view of theories trying to really understand what's going on from from uh, you know, a more outer perspective. It's, there is a lot of concrete work uh, that sometimes sound a bit, uh, sounds a bit extreme. Um, there is a lot of, there is another um, thing that is about software. Software made, software solutions like TensorFlow, PyTorch and all the other ones, they made machine learning popular. They, you know, they, they are simply great. However, sometimes they hide a lot of details to the people that they use it. So uh, I'm mostly thinking about people that start, that you know, jump into the machine learning fields at a beginner. They immediately follow a tutorial. They get immediately close to some nice looking results by writing a few lines of code or assembling blocks that are already there. But they are missing a depth understanding of what's going on. For example, uh, many people, I saw that also with the students that start our PhD here, they use this software without knowing the meaning of several of the parameters that are involved. They just take the default value, you know, they take them for granted. Uh, because, you know, there is a sort of strong emphasis in trying to reach the final results, perhaps without really caring about understanding the details. And another funny picture about this is the one of this little guy. It's just a joke, okay? Uh, this little guy that says, OK, I want to implement a semantic labeler using transpose convolution. And the teacher looks at him with, you know, by saying, OK, wait, wait a minute. You don't even know what a convolution is. And uh, that's what happens sometimes also with many people that are starting to study machine learning. They just want to reach the final results quickly. 
uh, using you know things that read on blogs and with a superficial understanding of everything they are the sort of not considering several important details um, so yeah that's something i i already did i already already uh, think uh, discussed um, but uh, the issue with this uh, i would say problem of people that are missing several details is that uh, they are very good at reproducing things that they see but they have several issues in moving to new problems to face new problems uh, because as i said they learn to do things but not really understand the details of what we do so when they find a setting a situation a problem that is not exactly so similar to what they have been exposed so far they have issues in adapting their understanding to these new models that's what at least i i see also i concretely see with uh, uh, with students uh, and also with people in the industry with some some people in the industry of course not all of them but uh, you know there are uh, some people that are you know they they, they they jumped into machine learning only recently and they were attracted by you know short-term results uh, but they have issues in uh, uh, exploiting uh, new uh, or facing new problems so it's a matter of there are several of these uh, trade-offs uh, in between opportunities and the capability of exploiting them. Nowadays, the industry uh, is showing a huge amount of opportunities for machine learning. And uh, the capability of exploiting these opportunities, uh, it's, I think, uh, not enough, not always enough, uh, because uh, we really need to, uh, to go beyond that. Today, uh, we really uh, are not there yet from my, from my point of view. So this basically projects uh, ourselves to the to the last part of this seminar. So uh, now what? Uh, I've been talking about the past, showing what happened, emphasizing great results, emphasizing great results that are there today on deep learning, machine learning, and AI in general. But I also raised a lot of concerns because we must consider those concerns in order to understand what to do now. So the first thing that we have to do is to carefully pay attention to education. And when I say education, I mostly mean uh, emphasizing, uh, letting people understand things to a very low level detail. Well, not a very low level, but to a lower, lower level detail than what they are exposed when they use modern software solutions. Because otherwise they will have less capabilities of adapting to new problems, as I already said. And moreover, we must reduce the overinflated expectations that are incorrectly circulating in some communities. Um, here I have to distinguish between research and the industry because I think that the research community is very well aware of this, these limits because you know there are people that are following conferences, they check papers, they check new results, so they know what are the limits of these technologies. While in the industry, uh, it's this, um, this sort of understanding of the limits is less uh, marked is less uh, evident uh, and uh, there is sometimes still this uh, misleading misconception that uh, uh, with deep learning you can solve everything and everything is ready to go it's just a matter of hitting the, the play button and everything will work uh, we have to pay attention to reduce these expectations so that people will understand what works a lot of things what work a lot of things work very well what doesn't work so that we really need to circulate this, this message concretely. And the other message is that, yes, there are great results, but there is still a lot of things to do. Uh, you don't have to think that uh, humans are completely beaten everywhere and you can immediately replace them uh, in, in every possible task. There is, we are not there yet at all. So going back to the, uh, to the language of this picture, okay, the visual language of this picture, uh, it's time to build, to try to build a spaceship. Um, we have to accept a performance decrease when we work, when we work as researchers, in order to uh, lead to, to get better understanding, to uh, invent and propose new models, uh, to uh, invest in longer term projects, because the speed of modern machine learning research is too high. We have to reduce that speed in order to invest in longer term projects. Um, I can tell you that the research community nowadays is way more open to this than what it was five years ago. There has been a moment in time in which really submitting a paper to a conference 
uh, most of the time, uh, you know, um, uh, was ending up in getting the paper rejected because there were not enough, uh, you know, results in benchmarks, not enough improvements in accuracy. And of course, you need to, to show the experimental quality of what you propose. But anyhow, even if you get state of the art performances, if there is a nice idea that you are proposing, if there is a new direction that you are proposing, yeah, the community must be open to this because it's like, uh, you know, the, the, the spaceship that you see here. If you just make jokes of the monkey that is trying to build the, shape, the, the, the spaceship, well, mm, you will never reach the moon. Well, you should try to, to help the monkey. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, you know, I'm just, I'm just mostly repeating myself. You see this, this kind of table. I randomly took it from, from some paper. I don't even remember which one, uh, but you know, that was the kind of paper that, you know, uh, some people expect uh, in your, uh, the kind of table some people expect to be in your, uh, in your paper, your research paper, comparing with, with uh, an insane amount of other models in an insane amount of settings. Uh, this, you know, is an issue also if you consider that major companies are investing into machine learning also from the research point of view. I'm thinking about Google, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, and uh, they have hardware solutions. Uh, they have, um, you know, number of people and they make investments uh, that are, uh, you know, they, they allow them to reach this level of comparisons and of experimental activity. But of course, that's not for everybody. I'm mostly thinking about the academy all over the world with a few exceptions. So that if we just uh, keep uh, looking at machine learning as something in which you have to do more and more experimental activity to convince people we are not in the right direction. We have to really evaluate ideas for what they are, of course, checking experiments as well but we must be open to new stuff. That's the first message. The second one is, do you remember that when talking about the past, I was talking about um, the origin of deep learnings and there wasn't supervised learning there. Uh, then at a certain point, it disappeared completely because big data sets became available. Everything was completely uh, supervised and uh, you know, um, people forgot about this. However, humans do not learn by being exposed to, I don't know, an insane number of supervisions. I'm not saying that, you know, we have to build machines that are exactly like humans. Uh, you know, we would like to do that, but, uh, you know, we, are, we must be inspired by humans uh, the, the more that we can. Um, and, uh, you know, it's evident that uh, we cannot keep pushing the attention and the energy, the required energy on building big data sets. We must think about machine learning algorithms that can do more than that, that can learn from an unsupervised experience with some interactions, of course, some supervisions, but they must be very efficient to this. Uh, so it's, uh, it's unsupervised learning, semi-supervised learning, self-supervised learning. There are several keywords circulating nowadays. That's something on which we have to put our attention back again. And, uh, you know, uh, that's, that's really a very important point. And uh, uh, it's like uh, some ideas from the past that were considered important and discarded because of, you know, the growing ubiquity of other kind of data sets. Now we have to look back at this kind of learning dynamics. We want machines, we want intelligent agents that are able to, to see the world to exploit reality, to process data, to understand by looking at this data and a few supervisions. That's the kind of uh, thing that one might uh, look at. Uh, and uh, there is also the, the role of the environment. We want machines that live in a certain environment. It's uh, everybody assumes that it's all about benchmarks, but when you release, when you deploy your model into the real context in which it is supposed to operate, if the benchmark was not completely coherent with that, and that's usually the case, you will see different performances. So we need to think about developing algorithms for artificial agents, considering also the, the context in which they are living. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, we also have to consider strongly, more strongly, the multimodal setting. If you remember, I mentioned caption generation, so language and vision, okay? You provide an image and the machine generates language. We have to think about algorithms, agents, that are able to exploit vision, to exploit language jointly uh, in order to do something better. 
And uh, that's uh, this kind of multimodal interaction. I mentioned, you know, language and vision, but, you know, any kind of uh, sensorial experience you can get from the outside environment is okay. We have to think at the different at these different modes to operate together jointly because we have the tools for doing that in a very very good way. Uh, and also when considered in terms of uh, you know uh, systems that continuously learns from data. Um, don't get me wrong, this kind of systems were already there since so many years, systems that are exploiting language and vision or other things. But in the past, several years ago, they were just an ensemble of, you know, independent modules uh, that were, you know, uh, joined together somehow. We, I think it's a time in which we can devise new, uh, new algorithms that are really starting from this point of view, from the point of view in which you have multimodal data and uh, you go ahead with this. Uh, another important thing that we should consider today, so I already mentioned unsupervised learning, I mentioned this uh, multimodal interaction, uh, it's also time. Uh, modern machine learning algorithms, they learn from data, the data is randomly shuffled, you know, take image classifiers, you take images and you provide them to the machine and the machine learns out of them. The data order does not matter. Uh, actually, that's not how we behave. I mean, I think that uh, it would be complicated for us to, to learn in a, in a world in which our visual system is exposed to images that continuously change with no uh, you know, regularities over time. Uh, that's another thing that must be strongly considered in uh, developing new algorithms, because we have to move from what is just an iteration index to time. Many people think that it's all about a certain iteration index. Take the case of recurrent neural networks. You know, you go from one element to the other one to the other one of the sequence. And, you know, each element of the sequence is just identified by an index. We're not talking about the time it takes to move from one element to the other one. Uh, that's just a simple example. And, uh, you know, I'm just again, just qualitatively telling you this. But uh, the point is that time does matter. And we have to consider the role of time in learning, uh, especially in the case of lifelong learning. So systems that are turned on, they live together with you on the, or they keep living and they keep learning. Um, because nowadays, uh, most of the systems that uh, are commonly deployed, they are based on the idea of training them offline, then fixing them, freezing them, sorry, and then using them in a product. But actually, we want models that adapt themselves continuously to the environment. So online learning has, seems to be more appropriate to that. And also learning in the wild, that's the keyword that is commonly used. So thinking about algorithms that are uh, not only working in artificial experimental conditions that might or might not be so related to the realistic setting in which you are going to go. Uh, we want to emphasize, we need to emphasize the adaptability of machine learning models in order to face a situation in which your product, your machine, is exposed to reality, and the reality is a bit different from the operational condition that you considered when designing the, the algorithm, when training the algorithm. So we must think about solutions that can adapt them, themselves over time. So I go back to the role of time, I go back to the role of unsupervised learning, and all the things I mentioned so far. Uh, another important ingredient that we have to consider for the future uh, it's uh, the availability of knowledge, availability of important resources that are the outcome of several years of work and that are commonly not, not always used in, in uh, modern machine learning. Um, I'm talking about structured data, knowledge graph, uh, lexical resources in the case of text, and whatever, uh, you know, tries to, whatever contains an insane amount of information. This is just to say that it's not only a matter of providing examples and supervisions. We want the algorithm to be strongly related to other types of knowledge that we can provide and that it's already there, we just need to use it. It's complicated, of course. There is a big um, research area in the context of machine learning. It's neurosymbolic learning that is already following this direction since several years. But I think that this point must be stressed more and more. Uh, the fact that there is external knowledge that uh, we can use uh, and that could be structured. Of course, uh, there is another, just uh, some, a couple of things I have to say before concluding. 
Um, one is the, the fact that we want to develop machines that are able to explain what they did in a human understandable manner. Uh, as example, here I'm citing a European project called Taylor with 53 partners all over the Europe that has the precise role of creating group of people, uh, a scientific network that is about the topics of trustworthy and explainable AI. Uh, because, you know, with this uh, growing ubiquity of machine learning everywhere in products in our lives, we really need to develop solutions that are trustable and that can explain what, what goes on because otherwise we will always be left with a big question mark on why the machine did a good or a bad prediction. And uh, we never have a way to measure uh, the capability of the machine or really quotes thinking as we would do in the same conditions. So trustworthy and explainable AI. Uh, you remember this picture, I already used it in previous slide. We also have to invest into designing models that are not, you know, uh, that are you know, more compact, uh, that are more, let's say, green with respect to others, because we cannot keep climbing. You remember the monkeys that are going on the tree. Uh, we cannot keep going on top of taller trees and use bigger and bigger data sets, bigger and bigger hardware solutions. Uh, sometimes we really need to, you know, to go back, think and find other uh, alternative uh, ways to develop nice models that are smaller and that are less you know, aggressive in terms of uh, uh, power that is exploited. That's another important direction for the future. Um, last thing I want to say uh, is about uh, a skill that has emerged to be important. You remember, important, sorry. You remember the cloud, the cloud here, that was about the cloud of papers, the cloud of libraries, of whatever is about machine learning you can find nowadays. It is huge. There is a big, big value in uh, who is able to uh, discriminate what is important and what is not in this big cloud. Uh, this value, I mean, it's always been so important, but given the size of the scientific production here, that's way, way more important. Because if you just look at what's out there on the web, it seems that everything is solved. There's a solution ready to go for everything. That's not uh, the case. So having the capability of keeping eyes open, and when I say open, I mean focus in the right direction, it's insanely important both for the academy and the uh, industry. So um, in this, you know, long uh, story, because, you know, that's, it's a story, the one that I've been uh, uh, talking about so far, uh, we have been reviewed, reviewing uh, 20 years of machine learning with a big focus on deep learning. So what's the overall message? I mean, progresses have been great. One might say that, of course, in 15 years, you expect to have some progresses in terms of technology. But I think that in these precise technologies, we really observe something great. Um, the other thing is that several ideas from the past are what made deep learning, or what are at the basis of nowadays deep learning. However, some of those ideas were sort of neglected, forgotten. I'm still thinking about unsupervised learning, progressive training of models, uh, small number of interactions, small number of supervision, and so on. So the past was strongly inspiring in creating modern technologies of deep learning. There is still something from the past that we have to consider again. Uh, the other message, take home message from the seminar is that we must control the large popularity of machine learning and AI in order to keep our eyes you know, focused in the right direction. There is too much noise now. We really need to be able to uh, discriminate what's good and what's not so good. Uh, finally, we really need to start thinking, rethinking to the final goal that we as researchers, but also not only in the precise context of research, that we should have. The one of trying to build you know, autonomous agents that learn. Uh, it's not only about beating some benchmarks, we really need to go back, remember the spaceship, that's what we must uh, remember that we have to do. Um, finally, uh, there are, uh, this doesn't mean that there is nothing out there. As I said, there are great results, a lot of things that are ready to go and then can be transferred in terms of technology to the, from research to the industry. There is a lot of stuff that's a lot of value out there. 
However, we must really try to go beyond that and start thinking uh, to the future in terms of longer term results. So to cut it short, there is still a lot of work to do, but everything is extremely exciting and, uh, you know, extremely motivating. OK, uh, that's enough. Uh, I already told you what I wanted to, to say. I thank you very much for your attention. And of course, I'm here for, for questions. Thank you very much. OK. Thank you very much, uh, Stefano. It was brilliant. It was uh, very passionate to listen to you. Um, Thanks. As far as I'm concerned, I have uh, one question. Um, sure. Um, concerning the spaceship you talk about. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah I, I knew the spaceship was going to attract the attention. Of course. I yeah. mean, concerning it, um, I heard another webinar some, some times ago, not very uh, long ago, from uh, Jan Lecan talking mm -hmm. about the future of uh, deep learning. And he said that maybe the future will be somewhere hybrid. Uh, just putting in the fact that connectionist AI based upon deep learning will have to find some convergence with traditional symbolic AI in order to have um, what you say explainability to explain things what's happening and uh, this um, for him the spaceship somewhere will be hybrid that was a so I would like to hear your comment concerning this um, and to 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 bring um, to bring ex explanations around deep learning. So that's one one vision. And second, is there any formal approach in order to try to design such a spaceship? What kind of formal theory behind uh, people are looking? Okay, thanks. Uh, that's a, it's a very nice you know comment and and question together. Um, I think that, uh, you know, uh, there are these this, uh, big two, two blocks, you know, of, let's say, traditional machine learning. Now, I don't know the, the exact talk you, you, you were referring to, but, you know, uh, the, the one that operates at a sub-symbolic level in which you have your data represented with, you know, numerical features and you try to operate with uh, these numbers, you know, to compute something uh, that, uh, that will turn out into, into a prediction that you can uh, you can see from the outside okay uh, on the other side there is something that is more related in the other box something that is more related to to ai in a wider sense uh, so you know uh, operating at a symbolic level with you know streams of symbols uh, reasoning in in the formal sense of of the word uh, and so on and so forth these two boxes have been let's say strongly separated in the in the last years uh, and uh, right now there is still not yet a, a nice marriage between these two boxes. I do agree on the fact that um, it's very important to try to put these two things together because uh, what you have in the symbolic part of what I was talking to is something that is easier to be interpreted if the symbols are something is something that humans can interpret. So I think that it's very important to try to make these two things converge together. I've been working on, you know, here in our lab, we have been proposing and working for you know, it's some years that we are trying uh, to do that with, you know, uh, neural networks and kernel machines in the first box and uh, logic in the other block. So to try to merge uh, logic knowledge, knowledge represented with the logic formalism with neural networks. And we did it with some special classes of constraints into the learning problem by creating a unique problem that tries to, to bridge these two things. That's one, one possible way. Uh, but of course, you know, um, it's not so easy to, I agree on the fact that that's definitely something that can open up also to explanations. Uh, let me tell you that I've been also working on something like this, the, 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 the situation in which it is the machine that tries to find uh, explanation in terms of symbols that human can interpret. Okay, we have been, and those symbols were belonging still to the logic fields. So uh, I think that's a possible spaceship for for the future. Of course, I don't know the the exact uh, solution, and the, the the neuro symbolic community is still working a lot on that. Uh, but uh, I do agree on the fact that these two worlds, these two boxes, the you know the old style machine learning and uh, symbolic AI should should be uh, connected somehow, both in terms of benefits, in terms of performances, and also of 
of explainability. Okay, and concerning the any formal theory behind that, uh, people are looking towards um, any formal model which exists uh, today. Yeah, as I, told, as I told you, you know, the the, the neuro symbolic community is about this. Uh, there are some models. Uh, there are several, you know, models that falls inside that that uh, that field. If you want to know more, I mean, uh, the, the the theory we are we are working on was called uh, learning from constraints, uh, and uh, it's uh, you know it's definitely in uh, in that direction. It could be something that perhaps you might look at. But of course, there are also uh, some other approaches in Europe that are uh, that belong to the umbrella of neuro uh, symbolic learning. I'm thinking about what is commonly done in in Belgium at the University of Leuven. The works from Luc de Red, for, for example. Uh, this, I think, uh, you know, it's, uh, they are both two, two important uh, directions that, that, you know, that follow what you said. Okay. Thank you very much, Stefano, uh, Thank for you. your answer. <laughs> and um, I do not see any other query around. Um, if so, uh, Stefano, I think uh, it's recorded. It has been recorded. It will be available for students uh, on our oh, that's website. Great. That's great. And. Um, Thanks again. Thanks a lot for your brilliant presentation and uh, and sharing that time with us. Thank you very much for for your invitation, and uh, I really enjoyed to be here today. Thank you. And it's just the beginning of a good uh, relationship too. So, yeah, sure, of course, of course. <laughs> so talk with you very soon, Stefano. Okay, thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Take care. Bye.